Good evening. I am so, so excited to be here. I just wish, precious, precious sisters, I just wish that I could reach out and touch you. I have missed you dearly. And I'm sitting here in the church and just thinking about the times that we've enjoyed together, fellowshipping around God's word and sharing time with one another. And I so long to do that again. I am so thankful that you've joined us tonight. And I just want to thank Dominique. She's at the back um, trying to run this thing and, and help with any glitches that come up and trying to make sure that everything goes smoothly. So I am grateful to the Lord for this beautiful, precious sister. But let's go ahead and start in on our study. Um, in Acts 9, we read about Paul, a young, zealous Pharisee and how he goes to the um, he goes to the high priest to request letters of the high priest so that he can go on into Damascus to bring back any of those that are of the way. Now the ones that are of the way, these are followers of Jesus Christ. And so basically what Paul is doing is he is asking the high priest for permission, letters that will give him entrance into the synagogue and into the city to bring back Christians so that he can persecute them, so that he can try them, and that is the only reason that he wants to go there. Whether me, the, the Bible tells us whether men or women, he wants to bring them bound to Jerusalem. Why? Because of heresy. Because as a strong, committed, zealous Jewish man, highly educated, these Christians are speaking against Jewish tradition and beliefs because traditionally the Jewish people did not believe that G the Messiah had come. They were still waiting for the Messiah. So on his way to Damascus, Jesus himself confronts Paul and a bright light starts speaking to him and he is literally thrown off his high horse. He falls to the ground and the voice from heaven asks him, why are you persecuting me? Which leads me to believe that Jesus himself is taking this personal. That day in the middle of an unlikely place, God confronts an unlikely man, and this man cannot deny the truth that is facing him. The beauty of that encounter is that Paul acknowledges the error of his thinking, and his life is transformed from persecutor to preacher. Talk about a 180 degree turn, complete turnaround. Who does that? Who chooses this most unlikely Pharisee to turn the world upside down? Jesus does. You know, ladies, when truth confronts us, it could be in a spectacular way, it could be in a bright light, or it could be that still small voice that speaks to us that tells us don't say that, don't go there, watch that, look out for this. But once we hear it and we acknowledge it, we still have a choice. We can heed the voice of the, of the Lord, we can t pay attention to it, or we can ignore it. Our scripture this month for our church is out of Galatians 1, 15 through 17. And I'm gonna read it to you out of the New King James Version. It says in verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and this is Paul speaking, and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And what Paul is saying here, he says, it's all been God. He's been in charge of my life all along. He spoke, he called me to preach to the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles were the dirty dogs according to the Jews. They were not the chosen ones. Paul said, I didn't have to call, I didn't have to text anyone to make sure to confirm this or to make sure they were hearing the same thing I was hearing. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Paul knew that it was God that was speaking to him. He was convinced, he was convinced. Who else would look at this persecutor of Christians, this man who approved the stoning of Stephen, 
and approved his death by, by do, approving the, his stoning he was approving the death of Stephen who else would look at this man and say that's the one I'm picking him I'm choosing him only God ladies from persecutor to preacher our God uses people that this world would call unqualified or maybe even disqualified you see it over and over in the word you remember Rahab the prostitute in the book of Joshua she's mentioned in the lineage of Jesus she is the one that took a chance on the Israelites and on their God she is mentioned as an example of a woman of faith who would look at a prostitute and say that's my girl right there that's the one I'm gonna use and mighty things are gonna come through her bloodline only a game-changing God can take an unlikely woman from an unlikely place at an unlikely time because the, the, um, the people of God were getting ready to bring down the city. And so this unlikely woman, this harlot, God chooses to bring the lineage of Jesus Christ through her. Now, what about Ruth and Naomi? Naomi is heartbroken. She goes through the unthinkable. She's in a strange land and her has, husband passes away. Her two sons marry foreign women and then they pass away. So she's left a widow with two widowed daughters-in-law. Hopeless and helpless because women in that day and age didn't have any income of their own. They couldn't own land. They had to rely completely on men on their, the men in their family to protect them, to watch over them, to provide a place for them, to provide for them. So bitter, heartbroken Naomi goes back to her homeland and one of the younger women goes with her. In the book of Matthew, Ruth, the young woman, the young widowed daughter-in-law, is one of the five women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. This young woman marries Boaz, the son of the harlot that we just spoke about, the son of Rahab. He is the father of Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David, King David. And so here, through the harlot and the widow, the young widowed woman, comes the lineage of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Who else would look at a young widowed woman heartbroken, out of place in, a, in an unlikely land? She's not in her, own, in her own land. She's chosen to follow her mother-in-law into a foreign land. Who else would take a look at this young widowed woman and say, I'm gonna do great things to her. Only a, a God who is able to change things on a dime. Our God, ladies, is a game changer. He is God of the impossible. Now, what about Esther, a little orphan girl? You know, as I was thinking about her, I thought she was raised with um, her uncle, and it never mentions that he has a wife or not. So if your single uncle is trying to raise a young little girl, probably her hair was all messed up all the time because he probably didn't know how to fix it. Who's going to talk to her about growing up into a young woman, little orphan girl? Can you imagine? Probably wearing crooked chongos, unkempt hair. Men don't really pay attention to those details. And she grows up to become a queen and save God's people. Persecution comes to the Jewish people. And as Haman plans to kill all the Jews, Esther steps in and rescues God's people. Who else would take a little slave orphan girl, not a, not a slave, a little orphan girl, and use her to change that, the, the whole situation with his people? Our God is a game changer, ladies. I want you to remember that. He's able to turn things on a dime. I don't know what your situation looks like right now, but I know what my God can do. I've seen it in his word over and over again, and I've seen it in my own life. I want to read to you a scripture out of Jeremiah 1.5. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. 
before you were born, I sanctified you. And that word sanctified means set you apart. Before you were formed in the womb. You know, I'd, I'd read that scripture many times and I hadn't really, I hadn't really alighted on that word before. Before you were that little sparkle in your biological daddy, God knew you already. So here's my question to you tonight. Where were you before you were in your mother's womb? Where do you think you were before you were in your mother's womb? The word says that God knew you before he formed you in that womb. I believe you were in his heart. I believe that he already, he already had you on the inside of him. You were in Christ before you came into your mama's womb. What an amazing God we serve. Look at Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. It says, this is the Apostle Paul talking, and he's talking about Jesus. He says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Here you are this night listening to his word. You are chosen to know him, chosen to love him, chosen to be loved by him. And this word tells us before the foundation of the world, ladies, before the foundation of the world, he chose us that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5 says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You are the good pleasure of his will. And as you fulfill your calling and, and your, um, your place in, in what God has called you to do, you are his good pleasure. It's amazing to me that before the foundation of the world. It wasn't at conception that he had a plan for you or that he knew you. Your life and my life had meaning way before that. And you know what we're doing now? We're just finding our way back to that place. We were talking earlier here in this, around the same table, how this world will beat you down. Your own family will beat you down. The media will beat you down. The magazines and, and, um, and, and, um, Everything that you hear on, on Facebook and, and media, it beats you down. And it expects you or it tells you that you should or you shouldn't or you should wear this or you should wear that or sh you should look like this or you should look like that or sh you should do this, you should do that. You are already accepted. You are already beloved of God. Beloved, not just loved, but beloved of God. You belong to him. Before the foundation of the world, he knew you. And here's something that I love to say. He knows what he's getting when he gets you. You know, earlier uh, I made this comment that sometimes we go through life thinking that we have to balance God's scale or his book because God's in the red and so we have to make it in the black. No, ladies, no. We just have to be his daughters. We have to be his beloved. We just have to trust him. We just have to lean back into his arms and allow him to love us and allow him to lead us. I love that he loves us so much that he gives us a free will. And sometimes that free will is a downfall, downfall for us because we make crazy decisions left on our own. But if we trust him and if we commit ourselves to him daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes minute by minute, he takes such good care of us. You know, sometimes people say when terrible things happen to them, well, you know, God, God did this to me. A loving father does not break your leg to teach you a lesson. A loving father is not going to bring COVID to you. Yes, COVID is in this world. I believe so many times that we've done so much to our environment and we have, we have made so many crazy things up in laboratories. And so we're in this world, but we're not of it. And a loving father, he loves you so much. His will is to bring you through no matter what this crazy world brings against you. So let me ask you, chosen one, how are you and I going to finish out 2020? How are we going to walk this out? Are we going to allow 
uh, a God to use us, unlikely vessels, during an unlikely time, in unlikely places, most of us quarantined in, in our own homes. How are we going to finish out 2020? I, I feel for the children, especially for kids right now, you know, kids, little kids having to wear masks and, and having to be super careful. And I have a little four-year-old that talks constantly about corona, the coronavirus. I know that it's a, it's a time of uncertainty for our children. It's con there's confusion and there's fear for them. I feel for parents who are trying to juggle and balance jobs and children, the insecurity of the moment. I feel for the teachers, because I was a teacher myself, who have had so much added to their plate that they're at the breaking point right now. And I, I feel for workers, especially for uh, our local community and our local businesses who have lost income and wages. And I feel especially for those that have been sick or that are sick and for those that, who have lost loved ones. But now, more than ever, you and I, sister, set apart daughters of God, we must remember that COVID and quarantine and unemployment and sickness and death, nothing is gonna separate us from the love of God. So whatever time we have and whatever opportunities that we have, we have to grab them and we have to speak the word and we have to spread the gospel and we have to speak hope, the hope of God's word. Because you know what? This thing isn't over yet, but neither is my God. My God is not done. He is not finished. He is the God that will turn things on a dime. We must walk out 2020 with hope in our hearts, keeping our eyes on heaven because we serve a game-changing God. Ladies, you serve a game-changing God, a God of the impossible, and nothing in this world has a right to steal our peace, our hope, our calling, our faith, our future. We must continue to trust him and to point others to him. Would you allow me to just to pray for us for, for a moment? Would you bow your heads with me and allow, allow me to pray with you? Holy Spirit of God, we are so thankful that you have never left us or forsaken us. And Father, you said in your word that if we ask anything according to your will, that you will hear us. And we will have those petitions that we desire of you. That's what you say in 1 John. Father, all power in heaven and earth is yours. And we acknowledge that right now, Father. You said for us to pray for one another that we may be healed. And Father, some of us need healing in our physical bodies. Some of us need healing in our finances. Some of us need healing in our minds. Some of us desperately need healing in relationships. Some of us need healing in our weaknesses, Father God. Some of us need more strength from you, Father. You are eternal, Father God. You are constant. You are God most high. You are almighty creator. You are our peace. You are our provider. You are our healer. You are our righteousness. You are our shepherd. You are our Abba, Father. So, Father, right now, Lord God, I pray for my sisters. Father, I thank you that you, Lord God, you, Father God, encourage them father you renew hope and strength and faith inside every single one of them father i ask you lord god to minister to every need lord god across these airwaves father god across these screens father you meet every need i thank you father that you know you know father god you're intimately aware and so father we turn to you right now we don't turn, we don't look anywhere. We don't look to the government, Father. We don't look to how we can finagle this or finagle that or how, how, how we can make things happen. Father, we look to you, Father. We trust in you, Lord God. I thank you that the wisdom of the ages dwells inside of us. That is you, Holy Spirit. Father, there are some needs that were, that were texted into me. So, Father, I bring, Lord God, the needs that Anna has right now, Father. I thank you that you provide the finances, Lord God, and that you heal, Father, everything that needs to be healed. Father, I pray for Rachel and Janice right now. Father, you know their needs. I thank you, Father, for being a good father to them. Lord, we pray for Belen and for Jen, our dear sister, for Pastor Flo, Lord God, for Gloria, for Jorge, for Armando. Father, you know how to heal every part of them. 
Father, I thank you that you are the God of the impossible, that you heal brains and lungs, Father God. You, you heal... Uh, you, you heal blood, Lord God, and organs, Father God. Lord, I thank you, Father. I thank you for healing Belen and Jen and Gloria and Jorge and Armando and Pastor Flo, Father God. I thank you, Father God, for a good report on Andrea's results. We come against depression in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for biopsy results that give you glory and honor. We thank you, Father God for taking care of the Norda family, Lord God. We thank you for being everything that Melvin needs right now. Father, we thank you for Jennifer's early release, Lord God. We thank you for turning things in her favor, Father. We thank you for ministering to Bertha, Father, for giving Nicole strength, Lord God, for giving our sister Celia safe travels, Lord God, and for completing the good work that you have begun in Trav. Father, we love you and we're so grateful to you. You are the bomb in Gilead, Father God. And Father, I, every single time that someone was brought to Jesus, Lord God, they never turned away disappointed. So we thank you that you heal all that we bring to you tonight, Father. We declare that by your stripes, Father, your people and these that we have brought before you are healed in the name of Jesus. You are the Lord that heals us. You took our infirmities. You carried our diseases. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, we hope in you. We praise you tonight. We thank you that you are a God who, who changes things on a dime. You are our game-changing God. Father, tonight we just commit our lives to you. We commit our families to you. We want to let you know that we love you, Father God, and we're so grateful that we can call you Abba. Father, we love you. We praise you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. All glory and honor be yours, Father God, in his name. I love you, my dear sisters. I can't wait to see you. And I pray that his word, his life-giving word, would just touch your lives tonight. Be blessed, and I'll see you soon.